This is Sherry, WMNF's Development Director. Tropical Heat Wave is coming May 4th at the Cuban Club, and now there are more ways to experience this iconic festival. General admission tickets are available now. However, there's also the Ride the Wave ticket. When you ride the wave, you beat the lines and get access to the Oasis tent near the patio stage with food, drinks, seating, and shade. Plus, you can meet and greet with WMNF DJs you know and love. Ride the wave to WMNF's Tropical Heat Wave at tropicalheatwave.org. episode of Surly Voices here on WMNF Tampa 88.5. I am Liz. I'm one of your hosts. Uh, joining me via Zoom is one of our frequent guest co-hosts, Maria Cole. How are you, Maria? <laughs> Maria. Well, we'll get her in a second. Um, and then um, we will have Donna coming to join us. And um, it'll be a great show. We're talking about a number of topics, um, including bears versus men. Um, and so it'll be a nice, fun time. And if you don't know what that's about, we're going to get to it in a second. Um, and... We will take calls like we always do. Stay on topic, please. And you can give us a call at 813-239-9663. Or you can email to dj at wmnf.org. Um, so lots going on in the news. Nothing... Um, or very little of it, good news. Um, let's see if we can um, get Maria now. Maria. Hey, Liz, can hey. you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Yay. Um, so how are you, Maria? I'm doing okay for a sleep-deprived individual. A lot, a lot was happening yesterday for a May Day, quite frankly. Oh. Maybe that's what it was, May Day, May Day. May Day, May Day. That's a... <laughs> We should have had a special episode yesterday. Dang it. <laughs> so it's, it's crazy. So, yeah. So now you're down in South Florida where it's even um, hotter and balmier than it is here. Um, the weather or the politics? Both. Both. <laughs> uh, politics down here is kind of kind of cool or up here rather. It has kind of cooled down for for a minute, um, although I'm sure that will change soon because it seems to change a lot. <laughs> mm. So well, yesterday, our Palm Beach County chair out of uh, has resigned. Oh, and I we were not notified. 
uh, I found out because the newspaper reporter called me and said, hey, how do you feel about the news? And I was like, what news? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's not the way you want to. Um, to no. Yeah. And then, you know, I'll, I'll be so, uh, you know, we also had massive arrest of students on various campuses all over the country, including my alma mater. So, um, yeah. And now what's your alma mater? Because mine is uh, having it too, so. <laughs> yeah, Dartmouth College. Yeah. I. She, she negotiated for all of 15 minutes and sent in uh, the New Hampshire State Police in riot gear and canine and gas, tear gas and rubber bullets. And um, there literally was nothing but books on the college green and um we have students and alumni now calling for this new president's uh resignation she hasn't been there a year wow and she doesn't even know how we operate yeah dang yeah so i i am amazed because you would think a lot of people um of um of a certain age would remember the protests in the 60s at but the she's college. she's not that old. Oh. She's, 40, she's 47. Gotcha. Right? Okay. And um, she literally is more of a social media influencer than she is an academic. And uh, it's problematic. And mm. it's hypocritical. I mean, yesterday, yesterday it went from one thing to another, had me reeling, you know. Right. It's not just this, not but just it this. All speaks to this larger hypocrisy that we have on college campuses because um, there are certain things that that um, institutions don't want to uh, accept as mm -hmm. um, a space for dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Anti-black racism being one uh, labor issues being another. And anything that confronts um, the military industrial complex is the third. And right. when we talk about uh, what's going on in Palestine, it's really a conflation of all three that have provoked these young people to be out in these streets. Wow. And, and institutions do not and cannot reconcile like that moral calling that these students have right now. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's fascinating because for as much as they want to suggest that um, they are the space for dialogue, they indeed are not. They get to choose what dialogue they want to hear. Right. And, you know, I read a, the statement from the ACLU. I want to say it was they published it an open letter about a, a, a week ago um, that really confronts and, and, and takes up, you know, how we address dialogue and how we address these issues um, as it relates to our First Amendment rights mm -hmm. and sort of like cautioning colleges, institutions on, you know, how we how we take up this issue and to you know, incredible disappointment. None of them have been, have met the mark, quite frankly, in leadership. Right. Where, you know, where are all these people <laughs> that, you know, believe in the free exchange of ideas? I mean, it's, it's getting really scary in this well, country. Well, you had a lot of faculty get arrested. And yeah. then and you, you saw the, the literally... Um, the state police in uh, at, and Georgia um, body slam a faculty member to arrest her for peacefully protesting. Uh, see, people sit out there, the the armchair critics out there sit sit around and say, "Oh, these these people are looting and and they deserve to get shot with rubber bullets." They weren't looting yeah. though. I know, but that's what I'm saying is okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> 
You you come after people on the excuse that they're looting, but these folks aren't looting. They're just sitting there chanting and stuff like that. And so why why are we going after these folks with bullets? Rubber bullets nonetheless, but still. They're bullets. Bullet bullets hurt. Um, and I'm sure, I haven't done the research, but I, knowing how projectiles work, I'm sure that there has been at least one fatality due to rubber bullets. But there we are. Donna, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <gasps> yes, yes. Oh, you snuck out right. of town before I... Yeah, you snuck out of town yeah, before I... I, I <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I'm stuck in St. Louis. Stuck in St. Louis. It came up suddenly... Um, so we, we didn't know if we were going or not, but we're here and I am watching, uh, these protests, uh, from St. Louis, of course, the town that, uh, was the ground zero for the beginning of the BLM movement in earnest, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. As, as the culmination was Minneapolis. Is that's another place that I spend several months out of every year. And so it's really interesting that 10 years later, I was in St. Louis when Michael Brown happened. Oh, I wow. left St. Louis. Michael Brown happened on August 9th. I left St. Louis on August the 14th. And the skyline was burning in the background as I left Missouri. Wow. Headed east. Now, Here I am on the 10th anniversary and the college campuses continuing the tradition of of speaking truth to power and standing up to the academies uh, all over the country. Different type of protests, Uh, the young people, another generation of young people. This is Gen Z uh, center stage right now. And I think the larger arc is this. I think uh, Dr. Cole showed us. Uh, what it's like on the inside as an alumnus of an Ivy League school where this is taking place. I'd like to talk about the larger arc of this American spring. Okay. That we're having, yeah. right? In the tradition of the 60s, in the tradition of Zuccotti Park, in the tradition of BLM. I think this is different because these young people, this is more like the 60s, because BLM could easily be written off as the malcontent. Uh-huh. Uh, having a go at it again, right? The people right. who are always asking for a handout. There was a dismissive, uh, a dismissiveness of the establishment classes for this particular iteration of liberation, American liberation protesting. But this American Spring, as it were, I'm going to dub it that. I haven't heard it yet in the media, but I'm sure it's coming. Not because of me, but because it's coming, right? Mm-hmm. People will put two and two together once they're done being aghast at the images. That the... This is more like the 60s. In the 60s, we actually went somewhere with it. When the young people who are heir apparent, heirs apparent to the American empire say that we're not going to do it this way anymore, then we have a sea change afoot. Mm-hmm. That is what you're seeing. The propaganda around Israel and similar practices, uh, colonizing, uh, occup- occupying, um, empire building on top of people who already live there and saying that it's okay, finding ways to rationalize it has just gone out of style. And so this, this, the indication, as I see it, is that we are going to have a fundamental change in our foreign policy and in our thinking around empire building and its casualties. Oof. That sounds really, really heavy for the beginning, but but I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, we do have folks stacked up in the queue already, um, so let's let's clear them out, and then we'll pick up the conversation from there. Um, first, we have Sierra in Tampa. Hi, Sierra. Hi, hi, y'all. Um, it's me again. Uh, I think this is my third week calling in now, um, and I'm going to continue with everything she just said. Um, I am a Jewish American. Um, my family came here from the Holocaust, and I do not stand with the Israeli occupation force. I never have. I never will. Um, we're taking over and occupying another land. We are empire building, um, and we are paying for it. And currently, 
America, including uh, President Biden, is in contempt of the world court and yeah. to be tried for yeah. war, war crimes. And again, like I said the last few weeks, I'm not paying my taxes. I refuse to even file my taxes until I know that taxation without representation, I will not pay one more dollar to murder and genocide an entire civilization of people and wipe them off the face of the earth. I won't pay for it anymore. And so I think this is a very important discussion that needs to happen. In the year 2000 was my first year in college, and I went to Florida State, and I, I occupied the Florida State Capitol and protested from the year 2000 to the year 2003, the war in Iraq, and Jeb Bush and um, President Bush taking our country away from us, the American military complex taking our country away from us, and supporting this genocide. And what I'm going to say, and this is all i got to say, is we are Jews that are com- claiming this is uh, anti-Semitism are usually white people. And... The Muslims and the people in Palestine that are being persecuted are not. And what this is is racism, pure and simple. And we are trying to wipe off civilizations that were there long before we were. And I'm not okay with it. And that's what I have to say. Thanks for all y'all do. Thank you so much for calling, Sierra. And then we have Jiminy in Jacksonville. Hi, Jiminy. Hey, ladies. How Um, you doing? But, oh, you're you're gonna okay. you know end up end up being a co-host eventually. <laughs> I, I don't want to take that much space. I just love your show, um, and I love like I think uh, I don't know. It just makes me feel a lot less alone to hear you guys every week. Um, so, but I, I wanted to remind you, you haven't given at least I haven't heard the disclaimer yet this week, and um, I got opinions. So, um, oh well, here let me give let me give the disclaimer okay. real quick. <laughs> <laughs> The opinions expressed on Surly Voices are those of Surly Voices and not those of WMNF Tampa 88.5. Okay. Go. Okay, cool. Um, so just before, because I did, I wrote like this whole thing and I was like, that's too long. So I put it into another haiku. Um, and that's sort of around the idea of, of, of the police, which, which y'all have sort of touched on. Um, but I also, I wanted to note, like, just, just before I get to that, cause I also have a, a, sorry, I always do this. Um, well, not always. Um, so with that, I wanted to say, um, the, like, we're seeing a big problem in, in the more Southern states because, um, and I think a lot of, of, of the police aggression, um, in part, it is, it is, you know, the institution of the police and the history of the police and how it was was started, um, and and the fact that our our modern police force, especially in places like Georgia, are being trained by by the Israeli government, um, and they have like this whole exchange program, and like I think that's one of the things that incites so much violence. Um, but I also wanted to note uh, or or just just comment because um, I think i heard i heard i don't know if i misheard but i heard you say that that black lives matter the movement in 2020 wasn't as impactful um but i think that's not really i think that's not really um uh following the the fact that it was super 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 impactful online um especially in 2020 when so much of life was online um, I think it was like a mass education moment and a moment that woke a lot of people up to the necessity and the vacancy of empathy in our country. Um, but, but with that, I wanted to um, just, just read off my, my haiku for you guys. Okay. Um, indignant tears spill. Police protect and serve you. Not me. Who are you? Ah, I like that. That's a, a nice little like twist that. on it. Yeah. All right. Um, cool. Well, thank you. And um, uh, I hope you, you see a cardinal today. They're out again. Oh, okay. I thought they came in when it was fixing to turn cold. No, no they're out there. They're out there. Oh, okay. All right. Awesome. I saw one yesterday. Ah, okay. Bye. Well, that uh, I'm not an ornithologist. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Jiminy. Say never what? Lived in, this is a lady who's never lived in a blizzard weather. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Except Georgia. One year it, it, there was a blizzard in Georgia while I was there, and it was frightening to me. But anyway, all right, we got one more caller, and that is Simon in Lakeland. Hi, Simon. Hi, good morning. I'll keep this brief. Two points. 
if people really want to understand this conflict, I recommend a debate that was on Mark Lamont Hill's <coughs> own podcast versus Mossab Hassan Yusuf, who's the son of the co-founder of Hamas. Now, Lamont Hill wrote a book with Mitchell Plitnik, and if you watch the debate, so I watched it, it's about an hour and 15 minutes, it's death by a thousand cuts by Yusuf, who was the son of the co-founder of Hamas. It's uh, Hill's a joke. Anyway, with regard to the other issue that people don't understand is that Dr. Cole, who's on Zoom right now, and the kids who were not able to go to school who were on Zoom, and probably the likelihood Donna's laptop are all probability have a Intel computer chip in them that was researched yes. and developed by Israel. Yes. Okay. We're not disputing that Israel has made great contributions to the world and to technology. Yeah, but we, we're not going to be able to do genocides because we gave us the, gave people we made computer chips. Yeah, so those are. <laughs> yeah. I don't you know those things. Well, another issue like Jamal Bowman in New York. The uh, there's a, a gentleman. His name is Mike. He's a real estate uh, developer in New York. He, so he trolls Bowman as the chief rabbi in Gaza named Linda Goldstein, and he trolls Bowman. By saying that he's capable, she, Linda Goldstein, <laughs> uh, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for Bowman's re-election coming in November. And what is Bowman's campaign? Contacts this fictitious chief rabbi in Gaza. That's how uninformed these people are. Okay. So, so Simon, if you want to send links, I'm happy to post them for whatever well, debate well, that you... All, you know, Liz, with all due respect, we're already missing two homeworks that were supposed to be handed in. One was on Sirhan Sirhan, and the other one was on the Palestinian survey that I had sent you. Okay. So we will, we're going to put a pin in this, Simon, because I do want to circle back to Sirhan Sirhan, but we have to do that next week because the, the okay. format for this okay. week is is already set. Okay. But yeah, we're going to circle back to that next week. Trade trade in your computer, your laptops. No Intel chips, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not be hypocritical now. Okay. Talk to you later, okay, Simon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye. So, right. so, so yeah. I think I think I think I can purchase an item that I I, I think we we bought we purchased the computers we purchased computers because that is where we are in the world in technology right right um, I think that if Henry Ford was the only maker or the main maker of cars I do not believe that people would stop driving cars because Henry Ford was found to be a pedophile. I think what would happen is... And a racist, say, massively. Oh, yeah. oh well, and, that's the, that's and a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah, yeah, he was... He so that was, was that era, right? <laughs> but we didn't stop driving cars, and people didn't actually stop driving Ford. I think that what happens here is we look at ways that we're not funding genocide supporters. Mm -hmm. Do we know? I mean, do we have all of the information? Do we know that Intel, uh, the maker of these processors, uh, support the genocide? There are people and organizations and many companies in Israel who do not support this. Mm -hmm. So we need more information other than to say it's a fat crayon to say processors come from Israel and therefore we should support genocide. Possible. Yeah, and that's that's where the disconnect I had is. It's like, wait a minute, you know, just because you do one, I mean, Hitler was a mediocre artist, but we're not going out and buying his works. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not rocking to his beat. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to do better than that. And Simon, I expect more than that from you. Um, it, yeah, yeah, that was kind of. Um, grasping almost i think but we'll yeah, doesn't make us hypocrite yeah um so anyway um 
even even at USF, there were ten arrests and tear gas and rubber bullets and and you read the the description from the cops and it's like wait a minute <laughs> yeah i i don't think that there was justification oh well, they were violent they they threw back a canister of of the tear gas that we threw at them that don't make them violent sorry <laughs> right <laughs> yeah um yeah that's not how it works but yeah, you know, but you know now, what though I, too like i just have to say this right like because we spend we we spend a lot of money um in terms of we we give a lot of economic support to israel yeah right we do and we also give a lot of economic support to israel for that research for for medicine like they have universal health care and we do not okay let's just put things in perspective (laughs) right (laughs) we also do the same thing language dr cole (laughs) so let's disabuse ourselves of the notion that any of this is hypocritical this is capitalism at work yeah this is capitalism is what capitalism does you know Right. It turns a blind eye to oppression and makes sure that we pay the highest price to the to to the highest bidder. Yes. Exactly. Um Donna, your guest Marlo Jones is on. Okay, so let me introduce Marlo. You guys, we didn't tell you at the top of the show. I apologize for that. I'm moving at 100 miles an hour over here, right? Not in my natural habitat, which is my front yard with the Cardinals. <laughs> I know. I know. Donna's yeah. got like this big nature preserve in her yard. So I do. I do. And I miss it. So here we, here's what we got. Uh, Pasco County organizer Marlo Jones. What a treat for you today. Speaking of police brutality, speaking of student protests, Marlo is a passionate resident of Newport Ritchie, Florida. He emerged as a prominent figure during the George uh, Floyd protests, demonstrating his commitment to justice and equality with an unwavering belief in the power of peaceful activism. He has passed the torch to the next generation of young American leaders. He and other civil rights activists were instrumental in making sweeping policy changes in the city of Newport Ritchie and the city council fighting for justice and equality. Now, Marlo works with the nonprofit Faith in Florida, helping to educate and empower his community uh, that helps the voiceless find their power. So, Marlo, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Donna. So the way that we, I'd like to do this is for you to, I know you've done this a million times. I'd like for you to tell our listeners what happened in Pasco Ritchie, in, New, in Newport Ritchie, Pasco County, Newport Ritchie. I always think, we think of Pasco County. When I think of a place as being like racist, some place that I'm, I'm terrified to go, I think of the county. <laughs> Instead of the city. Absolutely. Though. So, so I, I apologize for that. So That's over okay. in Pasco County, tell us what happened that summer and how it resolved so that our listeners can pepper you with questions. Absolutely. So uh, as we all know, um, we all seen and throughout the world that horrible video of George Floyd being murdered. And um, that sent shockwaves not only throughout our world, but throughout throughout places in our community that we never thought we would see uh, protest, particularly here in my community, Pasco County. I remember when that happened, there were protests that were happening all around in Tampa, St. Petersburg. And one day I was driving down the road and I seen a protest happening right in my own backyard. I pulled over and I noticed that people out there were people I went to middle school with, elementary school with, teachers, dads, mothers, brothers and sisters and everybody was speaking from their pain. Everybody was speaking from what they had seen, the trauma of watching George Floyd struggle and and, and beg for his life. And somebody passed me a microphone and I think I just spoke from my heart. And from that moment on, a couple of days later, uh, Black Lives Matter Pasco County was born. And that was the brainchild of uh, Maya King, uh, Nina Bonita, 
um, they, these sisters came to me and said, we want to do something in our community. We want to stand together in solidarity. And they said, you have organizing experience and you are a brother. And every time you are out here with us, these racist people do not bother us. Because we were out there holding signs saying Black Lives Matter, you know, standing in solidarity with the things that were going on around the world. Um, and from that, over 150 marches came out of that. We would march day and night in the city of Newport Ritchie, where we felt African Americans and people of color were being targeted by the police department and by the local city government. And we knew this because we had the data to prove it. Mm -hmm. And once we started attending city council meetings, uh, you know, we would pro be protesting in the streets peacefully. Everything was always peaceful. But then something happened. We started getting all of these Trumpers and these MAGA people who would be traveling from Naples and Sarasota mm -hmm. far and wide to come and harass us. It was very reminiscent of the stories that my grandmothers and my aunts told me of the Klan. And the Klan would come to town on horseback. Well, these people would come on their motorcycles. And then through all of this, we found out that there was an officer in the Newport Ritchie Police Department who was giving out our protest locations to the militia, <gasps> to the, the white mob of people who were talking about, you know, if they seen us spray painting anything, they were going to shoot us and kill us. So a police officer in the Newport Ritchie Police Department was giving out this intel, which he publicly put on his social media. We went to the city council and to the police department. They fired that officer. Another officer, Bobby Labrito, was maybe a couple of months after the death of George Floyd, put his knee on the back of a young black, a young Hispanic kid's neck in our community. And we were outraged. We went to the city council to ask for accountability. They didn't fire him. They promoted him. Mm -hmm. Well, he was let go last year. Yeah, he was let go last year for allegedly sexually assaulting a minor that he picked up on a runaway call. Oh, wow. Oh. And, uh, yeah, so we have been fighting tooth and nail to hold the city of Newport Ritchie accountable and to hold their police department accountable. Because before we started our protest, they had six body cams and 50 sworn in officers. Their body cams were not on every officer. They would rotate one day, you get one, you get one. But yet we'd have so many issues with this department, their ethics and the, you know, what they would be doing in the community. They did not have a good rap sheet. Well, we held them accountable. And after the marching, the protesting and us coming to city hall and marching continuously, they all have body cams now, every single one of them. And if they didn't have those body cams or the cameras on their car, we would never have known what Bobby Labrito did to that poor, young, innocent uh, child. Gosh. And he picked her up on that runaway call. Dang. Oh my we would gosh. have never known. As he hit a deer in the process of going through this young lady's phone looking for explicit photos. And he accessed a database that was not uh, that he was not allowed to access. After all this was said and done, I think I became a target. I don't think I know I became a target. And I know that because of public information request. Mm. The city of Newport Ritchie, one night we were out peacefully protesting. The police are waving at us as we're marching down the street. A drunk person came out of a bar and attacked one of our leaders, one of our female leaders. He knocked her down to the ground. And I heard screaming and yelling. So as I make my way down the street, I noticed it's this drunk man that stopped us earlier on his motorcycle screaming White Lives Matter. And all of a sudden, I just noticed he was attacking the females in our group, like physically assaulting them. And I looked around and no police were to be found. And it was strange to me because they had been following us all night. Um, they later told me they were in a blind spot. But long story short, the man got arrested. A week later, at the end of another peaceful protest, I was arrested and charged with battery on a Leo. And they're saying from that previous altercation, when we were all attacked by the drunk guy, they said I allegedly pushed the cop's hand away, which I knew was false because everywhere I go, there's a camera following me. And um, it took two years of my life to fight the city of Newport Ritchie and the police department and the corrupt state attorney's office on these false charges. And May 5th of 2022, I was acquitted of all charges. And my life changed drastically before and after that. Wow. That's 
Incredible. Thank you so much for, for holding up the the protesting in in um, Newport Ritchie. I have family out there actually. I can I can hook you up with some young radicals. But. Oh, that'd be great. My family's been my family's been a part my family moved here moved to Newport Ritchie um, in nineteen hundred and twenty five when my great grandmother was five years old. And my, my family is actually the oldest black family on the west side of Pasco County. And oh, wow. The land, the land that my family purchased 100 years ago is still in my family today. Great. So, yeah, you're, you're well established in Pasco County. <laughs> we, we've been here for over a since We just celebrated 105 years. Awesome. Um, yeah. So... So, have you got anything on the agenda um, anytime soon for Pasco County? Absolutely. Um, so, right now, I'm actually engaged in a federal lawsuit against the city of Newport Ritchie and the corrupt individuals who, you know, ruined my life. Ruined my life. Uh, we are in a federal trial. Uh, we're going to trial in December of of, of next of this year. Trial starts. Um, it's in the district, the middle district, I believe, in Tampa. So we're getting ready for that, preparing for that uh, against the city. Um, I don't know if you all are aware, the city did make several attempts to have this lawsuit dismissed, which the judge denied. So it is moving towards a jury trial. So, you know, I've just been really preparing for that, spending time with my family, trying to enjoy, you know, the, the, the pleasures of life and just being alive. Mm-hmm. Um I'm also doing a lot of work with Faith in Florida. We're getting ready to have a regional convening on uh, May 10th of 2024 in Ruskin, where we're inviting all of the civic leaders and clergy leaders around the I-4 corridor. Where we're coming together. We're working together. We're finding solutions to the issues that we're facing in our community. We're focusing on elections because we know elections are here. Yeah. We just finished up a city council election where... Um, uh, Newport Ritchie elected the first Gen Z ever um, in its history. Uh, Burchell Butler the fourth, um, an amazing, amazing upset. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of officials are not happy, but um, <laughs> so we're just working in the community, really empowering that next generation of leaders. And I've been on the, I've been in the, I've been on the ground in the trenches. Mm-hmm. So if you were to give advice to somebody who was who was bothered by the events of the day and yet doesn't have a clue about what to do next, what would that advice be? My advice would be to reach out to someone who has been through it. Don't be afraid to tell your story and don't be afraid to stand up for your rights. Awesome. Awesome. Donna. Um, because right now with this climate we're in, as you can see, I was listening to the conversation earlier about the college campuses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, young people are young people are rightfully so frustrated. And as Harrison Ford say, the best thing that other people can do is move the hell out of the way. Right. <laughs> Donna, Maria, do you guys have any questions? Yes, I think Harrison Ford is wrong. Um, I think that the best thing that people can do is get behind the young people, right? So, yes. you know, the people, the people that are in the way, we know who they are. They do need to get out of the way. But the best thing overall for people to do is to say, I'm with you. I got you. Let's put together bail support funds. Let's reinforce you. Let's call elected officials and tell them that these kids speak for us. Let's be in the space with them holding court. I have seen multiple, multi-generational uh, groups of people. Uh, their parents were alum of that institution. They, are, they have a tent next to their kids. So we don't get out of the way. We get right next to them and support them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like our ancestors did and our grandmothers and mothers. Right. Because right. what we don't want to do... Is in in BLM, we use a lot of language of alienation and separation. We told people to shut up. We told them to sit down. We told them, can I Google that for you? And I'm saying that we improve as we move along. And so what we want to do is not incite people by telling them that 
They're still living and breathing and paying taxes and going through all of the same things that everybody else is going through. Gen, Gen X has student loans. So this is not just the youth problem. The youth have to lead because the people, the, it signals to the power elite that the, the voters that are coming into the electorate, the young people that are going to be making decisions have different ideas than you have. That's why the young people yes. have to lead ideologically. But it cannot happen with just the young people. We saw that with BLM. America yep. as a whole didn't get behind black people. It never really has. It fears black people, and it makes changes when it is afraid what black people will do. But it doesn't really stand with black people. And you can see how that trend uh, has swung back the other way, Marlo. If you look at it now, Absolutely. if you post something about race on Facebook, no one responds. It's over. Nope. That's done. And so it was a moment in history, I, a moment in time. It was a moment in history. So what I would say is let's not use Harrison Ford is a very wealthy white man. Yes. Let's not use his language. <laughs> let's not use his language. <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay. I'm, I'm going I'm to go ahead and move. Can we go ahead and strike that statement from the record, please? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go ahead and strike that, Your Honor. Strike that record. We're going to go ahead and use Donna's statement as well. We're going to go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'll rest, Your Honor. I'll rest. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go ahead and use Frederick Douglass's statement, but I like him better. Yes. yes. Power can see nothing without a demand. Let's demand together. Yes. Yes. Um, do you, Marlo, do you have some time to hang out with us and take some phone calls? Yeah, yeah, I got some time. Awesome. So let's I'll talk. Do it. Oh, somebody say something. Let's do okay, it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Okay, gotcha. All right, so we got Aton in Tampa. Hi, Aton. Good morning. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday to you. Did I say your name correctly? Yes, you did. Good job out of you. Awesome. Thank you for having me on. Sure. So I want to update something I didn't get to. About two weeks ago, you had a listeners, I think, sent an electronic message, and I called in, but at the end of the show, I didn't get to call back. Listeners mentioned something about ranked choice voting regarding the state of Florida, you know, need to do it, make it happen. Well, I was trying to contact you all. Several years ago, the state legislation and the governor wrote legislation to not allow ranked choice voting city, county, state. You can't have it. It's not, a, it's not happening here. Um, currently in Dallas, Texas, they're pushing to get it on the ballot, but there's a Tea Party member, Republican Tea Party member, ex-veteran, uh, opposing it, no surprise. So again, just want to make that clear, everybody. I, for years ago, probably like five years ago, contacted, emailed, made phone calls to city council, county commission, state representatives to get ranked choice voting in the state. But again, most people don't participate to no situation awareness. So just want to let you know, it's not available in the state of Florida consequences not voting has consequences and voting for the wrong party in this state has consequences right exactly uh, so I'll let them know that so people that want to protest again for any subject be it march on wall street black lives matter palestine or property tax use that energy please to contact the direct source your representatives that have a vote protests go to their office protests go to the state capitol or Washington, D.C., in their faces, not necessarily in their faces, but there, bring that attention to, because, <laughs> again, those are the ones that have bigger say than you and me. All right. So just saying a lot of energy is being wrong, used in the past and present. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for calling. Um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that a lot of y'all are not going to like. I am not a fan of ranked choice voting. Oh, Tell us why. It is it, it, because ranked choice voting got New York City Eric Adams. Oh. Okay. Yeah. What people have to understand is that the average person is not listening to this radio program right now. Right. And they are expected to vote and rank their choices. They are confused. They don't understand how ranked choice voting works. And I've never heard, I have yet to hear a cogent argument for how to do ranked choice voting because you know what the answer always is? Oh, well, in three or four election cycles, people will be able to figure it out. But you know who suffers in those three or four election cycles? 
You saw it happen in New York City with Eric Adams rounding up hundreds of students Mm -hmm. who were peacefully protesting. You've seen how Eric Adams has exercised his authoritarian power in New York City. Minority communities cannot afford for y'all to take your sweet old time to figure it out and get the kind of representation that they need. I will never support ranked choice voting because it's the people who can least afford it that are the most adversely impacted by it. Right. Exactly. And and I'm I'm not a big fan one way or another. I mean, I really I I mean, people couldn't punch the chads. Remember that? <laughs> it's like, and that didn't even require any brain power. <laughs> so, it. I just, I'm not as trusting of of my fellow um, constituency. <laughs> so, well, that's the thing, right? Like to Donna's point earlier about um, about how we lead movements. Right. Mm-hmm. We lead movements, but we were the we are the we stand to benefit the least by the movements that we lead. Right. But That's nobody's true. looking yeah. out for us. Right. His, and nobody's his. nobody's out there for standing and standing in the gap for us and making sure that we have access and opportunity. They got theirs. They've marched on. They've moved on. Right. Oh, and that's typical um, white feminism. I mean, you look back to the day. I mean, they used to make the the black feminists march at the end of of the line if they affiliated with them at all. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So Maria's right. Like, there's it's over with. The time is gone. No one's listening. Black people are still dying. Uh, there's still problems here. Same same problems that were here when I left are here. Um, they're still ticketing the kids on the train. They're still pulling people over sometimes twice a day in North County. Um, police brutality hasn't changed. If, if anything, the number's gone up slightly of people who are brutalized by the police and complaints from police um, activity. So here we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all right. And Eric Adams, I was just in New York and everyone, nobody likes Eric Adams. No one's happy with that story. Oh, yeah, Maria. Right. It's like it's like everybody. That's what you get with ranked choice voting. Yeah, I can see you how had, that. You had you had two far more solid candidates ahead of him that lost yeah. because of ranked choice voting. Yeah, wow. that it's. I don't know. I'm still trying to understand it. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in that same boat, Donna. It's like, wait a minute, okay. But, we're and, all gonna and, we're all gonna pool our, our choices and you know right. it's like and then here we have high <laughs> political IQ and we don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And now like your average person, which is like ninety eight percent of the populace, is never gonna understand it. Right. Nor do they care. They just wanna get on with their lives. They don't wanna pay an arm and a leg for um for child care, yeah. keep a roof over their head, and get a fourth job just for health care. Please. Exactly. Um, all right. We have Jennifer in Spring Hill. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, hi. Um, yes. Oh, I'm just calling because, you know, we were talking about how the the war and what's going on in Gaza. And, I mean, these things are like, this is going on under a Democratic president. We have a Republican president that's repulsive. These these two nominees, nobody wants. Young people don't want them. And yet we have a woman running for office that was arrested working with the youth, you know, trying to to hold the line in St. Louis. And so, you know, it's like, it's a woman's show. We got Simon calling in. And I mean, it's like, I'm not saying that men should never be a, his guest, but when we're talking about women's issues and surly issues, the Green Party has been putting women out as presidential candidates or vice president's candidates ever since we started running candidates. And it's been women of color, um, you know, it started out with Winona LaDuke and it's Cynthia McKinney. And, and I mean, it's just, the, the point is that, 
it just seems like people are like, oh, they're all upset and they hate this and they hate that about this or that government. And they keep jumping from running to one direction to the other. Like, it's really bad. The economy's bad. So let's vote for the other party. And then it just, it's just back and forth. But it's the same. They're parties of war in Wall Street. And anyone that wants to keep putting these parties in and won't take a stand and go outside of the box and go for a party that's going to be on all the ballots and help that party get on all the ballots. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just talk. It's just like people maybe like to complain. I don't, I don't understand. It's like I've been hearing people complaining since the 60s. And I do remember um, how Shirley Chisholm was treated by the Democrats, and, you know, which I call the disappointing Democrats because they seem like the good guys. Like Malcolm X said, I think he said, like, was, you know, beware the wolf in sheep's clothing, but also the sheep in wolf's clothing. I mean, it was something like that. And it was like... The thing is, when you think that there's somebody that's on your side, and it turns out they're not, and these things never change. This, that we're still in, in, embroiled in wars. It's a military. It's a, the parties of you know Wall Street and the military-industrial complex. And it's just, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, when are people that are progressive and on the left start to work together and get some things changed, but it's like people throw their hands up in the air, like there's nothing we can do. Well, there is things we could do, and the young people are doing it, and I'm really proud of them. It's it's making me feel like this is what we were trying to do back then, and maybe this is the time because of climate change and the things that we really need to address that haven't been addressed because of, you know, Wall Street. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm really hoping that there will be some more support for a woman running for president. In fact, I mean, there's also besides Jill Stein, who's probably got the best chance and for sure has the best chance to start out with more ballot access than any of the third party candidates at all. Um, when it started, and she's still working to get more. But the point is, there's also, you know, Claudia De La Cruz and there's a uh, Jasmine. Sherman, there's women out there, and I think it's good to promote the women that are running and trying to make some change because they're all on kind of the same page. And I would like to see them all start working together, and, and Jill Stein is open to that. And that's what we got to do is be open and not let the, the left be split up because I think that's what the plan is to try to get you know the left to just scatter once again and stand, stand strong and in unity. But I know that the younger people... And once they get engaged, and they're so, I mean, I've heard them speaking, and they're so brilliant, these, these young people that are at these campus protests. And they're our yes. future leaders. So, I mean, let them, you know, let them get their voice out there, support them, like you were saying. And we just need to start doing a paradigm change. And ranked choice voting, by the way, is actually we good. It might have backfired. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, um, yeah. It cuts me calling. off. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, yeah, we, we're not supposed to let any one person talk too long. Sometimes we yeah. forget, so. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're saying some good stuff, and we let it go on, and then we realize we got to go. Yeah, um, so let's we get. We're on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk to Mike in Sarasota. Hi, Mike. Hi, thank you for taking my call. First, I appreciate your emphasis on the Zionist-sponsored crackdown on student protesters in America, just as the Zionists oppress Palestinians in in, in Palestine, they are also out to eradicate free speech in the United States. But that's not my main comment. My main comment is, if there had been ranked voting in Florida in 2000, George Bush would have lost the election and the presidency, and we would have had Al Gore for president instead. All right. Thanks for that thought, Mike. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike. Love the history. Yeah, and it's you learn all kinds of things. Like um, somebody has sent me an email that there have been over fifty cases of. I've, I, I'm sorry, I'm here in Palm Beach County, Florida, where we are responsible for the hanging chad that gave. Yes, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> So ranked choice voting was not the reason why Al Gore lost. Ranked choice vote, uh, the reason why Al Gore lost Palm Beach County was simply because of the, of the design of the ballot. Mm-hmm. We destroyed that election single-handedly here in Palm Beach County. That was my first election here in Florida. Wow. Yeah. Well, it was one oh. to remember though, oh. right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And not to mention, you know, I'm a history buff. I love history. But did anybody ever stop to wonder, you know, the Bushes are from Connecticut and Texas. Why would Jeb Bush be the governor of Florida? What did they know? 
going into that? You know, what did they have up their sleeves? The truth of the matter is, we all know who won the election. (laughs) So Frank just gave me the finger, y'all. So we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, please. Oh, and the bears. Here is the story about the bears and we can discuss it again next week. Um, women have been asked, would they prefer to run into a strange man in the woods or a bear? And women are overwhelmingly choosing the bear. And so men are scratching their heads and, and making protests and stuff like that. So we'll talk about that. And I have one thing. Let me jump in there. Can Maria, can you come back prepared to give a seminar on ranked choice voting to help our listeners? I'll say Why yes me? for her. Yeah. Well, what? I'll do we'll the homework. Make this offline. Oh, 